Um, welcome back to the next session. Um, I'd like to begin the next segment of our day on the topic of China's Asia-Pacific relations and disputes. Each speaker will spend approximately five minutes on the topic and then we'll open the floor to Q&A. Uh, here beside me we have uh, Jiang Yuchen, who is a research senior fellow and director of the Department for World Economy and Development Studies, as well as director for the Center for Economic Diplomacy and Security Studies as part of the China Institute of International Studies. We also have Jack Delia, who is a professor of political science, the director for the Center for East Asian Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. Additionally, he was the attorney advisor for the Office of Legal Counsel for the U.S. Department of Justice. Also, we have Kato Yoshikazu, who is a lecturer at the School of Journalism at Fundan University and is currently affiliated with the Chaha Institute in China, as well as the Keio University in Japan. And lastly, right beside me, we have Arne Westad, who is currently a professor of international history at LSE and co-director of LSE Ideas, the LSE Center for International Affairs, Diplomacy and Strategy, together with Professor Michael Cox. Uh, and I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I was at the very first meeting of the China uh, Development Society, and I must say that this event has grown spectacularly over the years that I've been following what you're doing. So my deep felt congratulations on that. I think it is absolutely fantastic. It's great for LSE, it's great for London, and it's great for everyone who's interested in China. Now, I think the way we're going to play this, we, we're running late, uh, very clearly running late. We, we'll try to bring this session to a close no later than a quarter past one. And if it goes on longer than that, it will be without me because I have a studio appointment, which means that I have to leave them. I will say a few words initially, I will be very brief, then I will hand over to the speakers in the um, sequence that they're listed on the, on the program here. I've encouraged them to be as brief as they possibly can be. Five minutes would be outstanding. Uh, no longer than ten minutes is the rigueur. It's, it's what I will expect, because if not, we will go over time, and I want to set off as much time as possible for Q&A. Okay, so let me just start by framing this. I mean, some of the stuff that I've been doing over the past few months has been centered on China's relationship with its wider region. I did a book that came out last year called Restless Empire, China and the World Since 1750, and in that book I tried to explore, among other things, the historical determinants over a fairly long period of time for China's relationship with its own region. And since then, I've been doing a lot of stuff in the media and, and uh, in China and around China, especially talking about this uh, in, various, in various forms. And much of what has been quoted, at least, of what I've had to say has been pretty negative about China's current foreign policy orientation. And that's an accurate reflection, I think of how I see things. I, I see China's policy towards its broader region at the moment, and then I include Central Asia and South Asia, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Burma, as being problematic. Um, what I'd like to underline, though, is that these difficulties come out of a period of tremendous successes in terms of China's foreign policy. And that's the part that is often not quoted in terms of what I have to say. I mean, the Deng Xiaoping era, and immediately after, were filled with successes in terms of China's foreign policy. China went from being an isolated country, uh, isolated mainly by its own volition, over onto becoming increasingly integrated with its region, which is what is central, but also engaging the outside world in a much more positive way than China had done for a very, very long time. That's a tremendous success, and I think it will remain. Now, what's happened over the past two years, I think can be summed up best in the words of my friend and colleague Paul Kennedy at Yale as imperial overstretch. A lot of people within the Chinese leadership, not everyone, but quite a few, thought that China, particularly after the outbreak of the economic crisis of 2008, did fantastically well, did comparatively better than everyone else, and that China therefore could afford to put its own interests in a pretty naked sense in the driver's seat in terms of how it dealt with its neighbors. This strategy has failed. And it's not just a question of how it will come out, but it has, in my view, already failed. Its worst effects has been in Southeast Asia, where the current leadership has been able to undo 
two and a half decades of patient, very successful diplomacy from China in, 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 in trying to integrate Southeast Asia and the ASEAN countries into a China-led uh, region. No more. The accentuation of China's narrow national interests with regard to resources in the South China Sea has more or less alienated the whole region. I wouldn't say beyond repair, but it's created a situation within that region that is much more difficult for China to handle now than what it's been at any other point during the past uh, two or three decades. And there are other people here who can speak about the relationship to Japan. So I will, I will simply leave it there. I think out of a great success, the current leadership has created a number of difficulties with regard to its own region, first and foremost, that China need to rectify in one way or another for its own sake, not for the sake of others. Uh, when I speak about these matters, I speak, you know, it's, it, it's in a way from the inside. I mean, I, I'm not gone as far as some people around here when they say we and us, they mean China. It's not quite that way for me, but almost. I mean, I see this from a rather China center perspective. And I think on these matters, the current leadership have, on a number of issues, made mistakes that need to be rectified for China's own sake. So, by that, um, as a starter, I'll hand over to Jack, who is first on my list. Jack, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, and I, uh, I will try to be brief, because they may have more start time here. Um, I would agree with, with a lot of, of what you've uh, just heard about uh, China's relations with the region. Uh, obviously, it's a hugely complex question, many countries, many dimensions, so one can't uh, hope to tackle all of it. Um, but let me pick up with a little bit of where those uh, introductory remarks uh, left off, uh, which is one of the great puzzles in many ways of the last few years is the extent to which and the reasons uh, that drove uh, China is what we would say in the American idiom, throwing soft power under the bus. <laughs> that is, uh, the charm offensive had been quite successful. Uh, China was riding high, as you say, uh, and then it all it all came apart for, for reasons uh, some of which you alluded to. Now, I think it was always overrated. Uh, I think um, you know the charm offensive got a lot of hype. Uh, the Beijing consensus was a pretty silly idea, uh, and that many Chinese are very wary of the notion of a China model that is exportable or replicable, but there's a lot of hype and a success, not only with the global economic crisis, but the Asian financial crisis before, and the general rise in hard power had much to do with it. Um, and I think there was some amount of, of tweaking uh, a US imperial power that had overreached, uh, that as part of the attraction for China was a chance to stick a thumb in the eye of a fairly hard to take uh, United States. Um, and now it's come apart. It's come apart partly because of, I th think, its, its uh, weakness uh, internally to begin with. It's come apart to some extent as an inevitable consequence of China's rise and the sense of asymmetric dependence and vulnerability of neighboring states. One must always prepare uh, against what might happen uh, and not take uh, just uh, protestations or, pro or uh, professions of goodwill at uh, face value. Uh, but to some extent, it has come apart because of China's own choices in how it has dealt with its neighbors. Uh, imperial overstretch is certainly uh, one word for it. Uh, and I'm going to, in the very limited time I have, uh, focus on uh, what I think have been the focus of some, have been the, 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 the locus of some of this um, <coughs> problem, uh, particularly uh, what I call back to the future problems. That is 19th century style, maybe even earlier style, territorial disputes that have uh, been at the heart of, or at least have been a significant factor in China's deteriorating relations with its neighbors. And I'll talk briefly about uh, the South China Sea and East China Sea disputes, uh, and then uh, some about the less discussed uh, inland uh, territorial issues. So if you look at the South China Sea issue, uh, there have been tensions and even occasional clashes over many years, but it had been pretty quiet for a while. There had been progress toward a, toward a code of conduct adoption of a declaration of conduct, and then around 2010, the wheels came off. Uh, you had the fish. You you had the the the, uh, the disputes uh, heating up again, and, and recently it has of course gotten you know, even a bit worse. Uh, the flashpoints being things like China's establishment of a local government uh, for the Nanshashita Islands area, uh, the Philippines uh, uh, conflicts this summer over over Scarborough Reef, and so on, and prompting the U.S. to weigh in in a way it had not previously, uh, to to express its commitment to open sea lanes of communications, following international law. Uh, in the region and peaceful resolution of dispute, uh, and really getting involved in an area where previously the U.S. position had been more often to stress its lack of a stake in the territorial disputes and only its preference for stability. 
East China Sea, similar story. Again, a deep-seated, deep-rooted conflict that had been relatively calm. There had even been a joint development agreement for the Chunxiao oil field, gas field area. And then look what happened. The 2010 uh, fishing trawler incident, uh, where, the, where the Chinese fishing trawler rams Japanese Coast Guard vessels. And then the, the uh, escalation of tensions in the wake of Tokyo Governor Ishihara's threat to uh, acquire uh, the Diaoyu uh, or Senkaku uh, and the response of, of the national government to try to preempt that, but of course it spiraled into the crisis we now face in the East China Sea. Um, now, here too, there's been an impact uh, on extra-regional uh, relations. The U.S. again has weighed in, right? The U.S. clarified its security treaty commitment to encompass uh, the Diaoyu Senkaku area. Uh, and uh, recently, uh, Secretary Clinton, one of her uh, nearly final acts, uh, says the U.S. opposes any unilateral moves uh, to change the fact of Japanese control. There's a less dramatic but somewhat similar story in the Yellow Sea. Uh, China groups all three as the near seas, which looked at from a foreign perspective, you know, suggests a commonality uh, of, of agendas uh, that, that may be anti-status quo. So this is all very fraught, and it's likely to remain so. Why? Well, some of it is structurally built into the situation. Uh, the fact of a rising power and what it means for its neighbors and for the previously dominant power that is at least rel relative decline. Some of it, I think, is the nature of the principles we have to deal with these problems. Here, international law is a mess. Uh, it doesn't nicely resolve territorial sovereignty questions. Uh, it doesn't nicely resolve under the law of the sea what you get until you've solved the territorial problems and even then. And if you look at the way China has grappled with the very fraught politics of, of uh, territory, um, yeah, I think we, we can understand why there has uh, been uh, such tension and why we're not likely to see a resolution soon. First, the arguments are from history. Uh, the way international law and international relations sets up with this, much of it is about historical claims. Well, to the islands, history is very thin. Nobody much controlled them. And it's a very fraught history. It's fraught with imperial encroachment. It's fraught, fraught with treaties that China regards as unequal. Um, it, it's got all that. And it's a very thin history that all of the territorial claimants can deploy to some degree and to little resolution. China has pushed a very robust Chinese biased uh, version of the history. Um, and China has made very robust claims legally about what history gets you, uh, much more than, than American and other views of, of the importance of history to territory uh, would say. Uh, secondly, uh, China has made arguments rooted in the law of the sea. Uh, that is, what kind of rights you get adjacent to territory that you claim as yours. Um, and there, China has had a very expansive notion of the degree to which one can claim small specks of land as grounding uh, maritime rights, the degree to which China controls those particular rocks or islands, and the degree to which one can draw very large areas of ocean into the reach of what comes pertinent uh, to land, and perhaps most importantly, what kinds of rights you get beyond the economic sphere and security affairs uh, within the ex so-called exclusive economic zone. Here China's position is, at least from the US view, revisionist. Um, and uh, and the, the structure of these kinds of legal claims, both the territorial ones and the maritime ones, put a premium on exercising sovereignty. And that's what fuels these kinds of conflicts. You've got to have wet boots on the not so dry ground. Uh, you send ships out to patrol. You purport to exercise exclusive jurisdiction over the area. And so the legal rules have fed uh, this kind of conflict. Two minutes. Okay. Finally, uh, there's a the security rights issue. What China has pushed for uh, and has engaged the US in particular on is the idea that a coastal state has security rights and security interests not entirely rooted in the law of the sea, although they are to some degree. Uh, and here, the presence of the Seventh Fleet then becomes a provocation. The Chinese talk about the string of pearls, the first island chain, and so on, becomes a counter-argument. Uh, and, and we can see why the, the tensions continue. Um, and of course, the strategy of regional states, given that structure, has been increasingly to balance China by bandwagoning with the US on security affairs. So there's all that. I know I'm down to about one minute, so let me just touch on the other kind of speech, <laughs> the one people don't talk about so much, which are the landward borders. Yep. India is the only one that we really talk about as being unsettled. Uh, that too is tied up with history, it's tied up with ethno-nationalism, uh, it's tied up with potential uh, power rivalries, just as the East China Sea has meant rivalry with Japan, and the East and South China Seas have meant rivalry with the US. India has meant rivalry with the other great rising Asian power. The problem there is it's asymmetrical. India cares a great deal about China as an economic and political uh, large neighbor. China cares a lot less about India. That changes. <laughs> uh, uh, and, and finally, there is the other borders we really don't talk about because they're not really in dispute. That's Tibet and Xinjiang. 
Uh, these are areas where no one thinks they are not part of the People's Republic of China, uh, but we see the same dynamic of foreign concern about what goes on in territory that China considers its own, whether it's the islands, whether it's um, the disputed territories well in India, or whether it is, in this case, uh, Xinjiang and, and Tibet. So once again, we have an area where, um, it's the last thing I'll say, where uh, there is a question of foreign uh, assertions of some degree to meddle in an area that China considers China's, not for independence or secession, although that argument is raised, but rather to pursue human rights, ethnic rights, and things like this. So all along the periphery, uh, China is, is in friction with significant powers and are pushing an agenda that others consider revisionist. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm sorry that I have to hurry this up. <laughs> I'm particularly glad that you, that you uh, mentioned India. I, I just spent a month in India, and I can confirm everything that Jake said. Uh, they are obsessed with China. They are not always in a positive fashion, but certainly in a fashion that catches people's attention who have, who have China interest and who are there. Our next speaker is uh, uh, Jiang Yechen. Um, Jiang Yechen. Now, the whole international community is focused on China. With this attention, we feel happy but also a little bit impressed. Uh, we are very happy that the whole international community is focused on China. With this attention, we feel happy but also a uh, we're happy because when China was not such a big economic power, we were not getting a lot of attention, enough attention from the international community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we are depressed because as um, China's economic power grows, um, especially um, in 2010, we became the second largest economy in the world. We are getting a lot of troubles uh, along with this attention. Today, we're going to talk about the 